Good morning, Elgin Missionary Church, and welcome once again to Church Online. Today, before we get into anything, I want to give a big shout out to all of our K9 viewers at home, which I'm sure are very happy to be having a Sunday morning with their families as they watch the service together. <laughs> Way to go, dogs. Also, a friendly reminder that uh, during the stay at home order, the church is still closed, but pastoral um, care and the rest of the staff are still available for, for contact. Feel free to reach out and connect. Now, before we go anywhere else, we have a really important announcement coming up from our mission mobilization team and world partners. Over to you, Mary. Greetings to our church family. You will remember a month ago that I mentioned that the mobilization mission mobilization team had divided the year into thirds. Do you remember what the first third was? and who or what we were going to be doing? Good, I'm glad you got it right. In Haiti, we're going to come alongside, not help, as far as physical labor is concerned, make kitchen gardens for the families. Why are we doing this? It's a very serious thing. The soil is so badly eroded that it is not a great value anymore with the nutrients that are needed to grow food. Not only that, there has been no crop rotation. And as the farmers who live around here know, if you don't do crop rotation, that's bad for the soil also. Some of the teachers in the schools that have been teaching the children about farming, farming God's way, wanted to do something and they just need a little bit of a boost as far as things like seeds or other things that would be needed. How are they going to do this? Well, the children have all been taught in especially grades six to nine, they have been taught how to start these gardens, what to do and to farm God's way. First of all, they're just gonna have a little garden at each home in front of their houses one meter by two meters. Then they're going to work up the land slightly, not turning it over like we may do, just slightly, not to disturb anything. And then dig little ditches, and in those little ditches, they're going to farm God's way. They're going to use the ashes from their cooking and put it in and the manure from their donkeys or their chickens, their skinny chickens running around, and then cover it up. And rather to destroy or disturb the soil, again, they would just poke holes a fist apart and plant two rows of beans, two rows of spinach, one row of beet, and one row of onions. And because it's a warmer climate, they probably can do a rotation. Don't plant your onions here, but switch them to the, there. These foods have been chosen because they're highly nutritious and good for the families and the children. So, will there be any accountability? Will anybody check and see how these farms are coming or these little gardens? Yes, the teachers and the senior students have been chosen to go once a month to visit the homes. And when they visit the homes, that's when they will discuss farming God's way. But not only farming God's way, sharing the love, of Jesus with those families in the hopes that the Lord Jesus will become their personal savior. So listen now as you hear further things from Nicole and Marilyn. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Jones Conda, Assistant Director of EMCC World Partners, and I'm joined by Marilyn McElroy today, one of our World Partners supervised workers, who specifically works in the area of health and community development, with particular emphasis on our partnership with our uh, sister denomination in Haiti. And so we're excited to share with you briefly about a new initiative that we've launched called Education, Food Security and Community Mobilization. What the heck is that? We'll have a chance to explain it briefly. So I invite Marilyn to um, explain the nuts and bolts of this initiative. We have had a history partnering with the uh, AEM in Haiti and particularly and most recently uh, with uh, AEM in Jean Denot. Jean Denot community uh, is a wonderful community and they have a wonderful school of about 400 plus students. 
a number of those students that have been incorporated into the school have parents who are unable to pay. This initiative allows, uh, has invited 50 students, uh, children from ages pre-kindergarten all the way through to the end of middle school, grades seven, eight, and nine, uh, to participate, three to five students per class. The school, uh, the initiative uh, provides education in Farming God's Way for the students, grades seven, eight, and nine, right in the school curriculum. And then those students, those kids, 14 to 16 year olds, uh, will be out in the gardens working alongside Frere Ernso, who is the Farming God's Way trainer slash educator in the school as well. And they'll be learning practical uh, methods of uh, farming God's Way. Along with that is the other are the other students and their parents. So children who are from pre-kindergarten up to grade six, their parents will be uh, required to participate in the, the practical part of Farming God's Way. Yes, they'll learn some of the theory, but they're going to be um, uh, preparing gardens uh, one meter by two meter in their front yards, and they'll learn how to compost. They will learn how to prepare God's blanket, and they will be able to provide uh, nutritious foods, carrots, tomatoes, uh, cabbage, uh, green leafy vegetables that will improve the nutritional status of their children who will then be able to learn better in the school. And so it's exciting to know that teachers will be uh, going along with supervising the parents, those parents of 50 students, and the parents will be learning and Ernso will be uh, over all of those uh, in the school. We're looking forward to how this initiative is actually birthed out of the vision of our brothers and sisters in Jean Donat. Uh, there was a chance for us to hear this in 2019, their vision for a thriving community of Jean Donat. And that included healthy families uh, that were food secure and that were able to educate their children. And so Haiti currently ranks 169th of 189 countries on the Human Development Index. And it has one of the highest rates of chronic food insecurity in the world. And so we're grateful for the vision that um, these leaders in Jean Donat have um, for a vision of their thriving community and knowing the challenges they face. So we're grateful to God for the chance to partner with them in this initiative and more broadly than that to be able to facilitate key conversations in the community. We're grateful that teachers will be doing one-on-one -on -one visits to parents of students, that there will be increased connection there, that our AEM uh, church partners will be able to see and hear about the progress of this type of investment, and that we will be creating some space for uh, leaders like Erlinda Philogen, who's our global representative in Haiti, to be able to have community meetings to hear about the impact of this initiative and also to allow her to speak into what does it look like for us to all come together and see this vision forward. We would encourage your prayer in this initiative. Conservation agriculture and farming God's way is a new way of farming, a new way of investing in the ground out of God's all sufficiency. And this comes um, at the crux of also having generations and generations of particular farming practices. So we pray that these seeds would be rooted, um, not only in the practical and the technical parts of farming God's way, but also the biblical principles that God would speak to people's hearts. We thank you for your partnership and your curiosity. If you wanna know more information, feel free to head to emcc.ca slash worldpartners slash what we do and click on the integrating development pink tab there you will find a list of initiatives with this name, um, Education, Food Security and Community Mobilization. That's this initiative in Haiti. So we look forward to um, hearing your questions as you learn more. You can contact me at njones at emcc.ca and you can find Marilyn McElroy listed as one of our mission workers and partners. Thank you for uh, considering this and we pray that God would continue to speak to you on your journey with Jesus. Wow, that is such a great opportunity. For more information about what was discussed in the announcement, check out the links in the description below. Now, before we enter into worship, let's pray. Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can meet once again today online. Uh, thank you for this week that was, all the highs and lows that came with it. And we thank you for the week that's to come and all the highs and lows that come with that. 
Um, I pray for the mundane. I pray for the exciting. I pray for just everything in between, Lord. Thank you so much for our families and our friends and our dogs and uh, th- and other pets as well. And we just thank you for these things that uh, you bless us with. And we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And just, Lord, use this time together. To just help us grow closer to each other, closer to you. And uh, we, we just, we give you this service, Lord. It is all yours. This time is yours. And uh, we just thank you for that. In Jesus' amazing name I pray, I'm not ashamed. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood
to our kids lesson for today. Thank you for worshipping with us this morning. I am so glad you're with us. We are still in a series called I'm Crafted and it's based on the game Minecraft. You can see this amazing experience that I'm in that Brianna cre created for us. This week we're looking at getting creative like Brianna did and remembering. Now, we live in Canada and the capital of Canada is Ottawa. And in Ottawa is the Parliament buildings. And that's where Parliament is, where they, they make decisions about how to run our country. And on Parliament Hill, there are more than 20 bronze statues and monuments. Uh, the grounds are also home to the Canadian Police and Peace Officers Memorial. Uh, the very first statue was of Sir George Etienne Cartier uh, in 1885. And that was the first statue to remember important people in Canadian history. There are four statues that remind us of the Prime Ministers who played some major roles in shaping Canada. There is uh, the National War Memorial symbolising the sacrifice of all the Canadian Armed Forces who have served in Canada during war in the cause of peace and our freedom, past, present and future. Of course, we can't visit Ottawa easily right now because of COVID, but you can visit it virtually in Minecraft. People have created buildings and you can have a virtual tour. We have made, we have many memorials to the men and women in Canadian history. And it's important to remember our history and where we came from. In the same way, God wants us to remember all the good things that he has done for us. And he wants us to remember his faithfulness so that we stay faithful to him. And so we can share stories of what God has done for us and for others. Today's Bible story is about another great miracle and what the Israelites did to remember that miracle. And it's found in Joshua chapter 3, starting at verse 14, and you read to the end of the chapter and into chapter 4 and go to verse 9. And the story goes like this. Early in the morning, Joshua led the Israelites to the River Jordan, where they set up camp. The next day, Joshua told the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant to go ahead and to walk into the river. Now, the river in the, uh, was in flood and it was dangerous to cross. And God told Joshua to tell them when they got into the river, they were not to stop. Okay, so they were to walk right into this raging rapids, this river, and they had to show faith in trusting in God. And they walked into the river. And as soon as their feet entered the water, the water stopped flowing. Now, that reminds me of a story of Moses when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Well, this is now Joshua and God is doing the same miracle. Now, the men stood in the middle of the river on dry ground, holding the Ark of the Covenant, while all the people crossed into the promised land. So when Moses, uh, when the water parted for Moses, that was the beginning of the Israelites journey. And here 
they are crossing into the promised land. Joshua gave orders for 12 men to gather a large stone each from the dry riverbed and carry it to a place where they would set up camp for the night. And Joshua told the 12 men to set up the large stones they had carried from the riverbed and they made like a memorial, an altar to remember what God had done. When future generations ask you what these stones mean, Joshua announced, tell them that the Lord dried up the river Jordan just as he dried up the Red Sea so we could cross over. You see, God did this to show his power that you would always remember him. You know, when God parted the Jordan River, it was a reminder of his faithfulness to their ancestors as well. You see, the people that were crossing the Jordan this time were too young to remember crossing the river with Moses. And the people stopped to build a monument on the other side of the Jordan River to help them always remember God's faithfulness. Just as our God is creative, he made us creative. God wants us to use our creativity to celebrate his faithfulness. We can craft things of our own that not only help us to remember God's faithfulness, but to help share his faithfulness with others. When we're in Sunday school or junior church, you make crafts of the lesson that you learned that day and you're able to take them home and share them with your parents or your friends and share the story of what you learned. We are crafted to remember God's faithfulness. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, last week, the Israelites built a golden calf and that was bad. This week, they built a monument and that was good. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that one was built as an object of worship. The people actually worshipped the calf instead of God. The monument they erected next to the Jordan River in our story today was created to remind them of what God did for them. The monument of stones was not an object of worship, but a reminder of the one who deserves our worship. God gave us the gift of creativity, just as he is creative, making the whole world from nothing. Some of us are gifted in music, some are gifted in visual arts like painting and drawing. Some are gifted in drama. And we can use these gifts, however big or small, to honour God and to share how he has been faithful to us. The songs we sing in church are a great example of this. Each song was written as a reminder of something that God has done. Some are written about Jesus' birth and we sing those at Christmas. Others were written about how Jesus saved us from our sin and we sing those at Easter. And there are lots of other songs that we sing that remind us of how good God is, how faithful he is and how much he loves us. And the songwriters wrote those songs to remember God's faithfulness and every time we sing them they remind us as well. We can do more than write songs, we can do paintings or drawings, we can make crafts to hang in our home, we can write plays or make movies or write stories and we can use our creativity to remember our creator. Before I finish the lesson today, I want to show you something that I have that helps me remember how God has been faithful to me. Now, I didn't create this myself, but it still helps me remember. 
If you have been following my stories, I told you back in the summer of last year about a fear I had of feathers and how God set me free from that fear. And God was with me one time when I was in a store. There was a time that I couldn't walk down an aisle where there was even a photograph or a picture of a feather. I was so scared of feathers that even a picture bothered me. One day, several years ago, I was in Walmart and I saw a picture of a feather. God had set me free from my fears. And this time when I looked at the picture, I thought it was beautiful. So I bought it and here it is. I have it today to show you. This is the picture of the feather that I bought. Now, I could never have held this picture before, but God set me free. And this picture reminds me that God is faithful. And if God can set me free from my fear of feathers, then he can do anything. So I'm reminded that no matter what I'm going through, God will help me. Feathers remind me of God's faithfulness. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to remember all the good that you have done for us and in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that you are who God says you are. You are chosen. Now we're going to sing that song together. Here it is. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love. His love
Good morning. Thank you for joining in Elgin Missionary Church's online service. Uh, we come together today to worship God. We come together today to spend time uh, considering the instructions of the Bible to come under the sound of the gospel, uh, that Jesus Christ, God the Son, died for us, uh, redeemed us as we come to him in repentance and faith, and now the Holy Spirit takes all of that and impresses it upon our hearts and on our lives. And I come to the Lord today just giving thanks for all the Lord has done for us. Today we're finishing up a series where we have spent the last five weeks. And we've done so in the letters of Titus, uh, the three chapters of Titus, Philemon last week, and now Jude. And this series I have called Three Men and a Message. And we're doing this because someone from our congregation asked for it. We did a series last year called You Asked For It, and uh, someone asked me to spend time going into scripture and doing so in depth and choosing a book that we don't often spend time in. And I decided that it would be really good for us to consider these three small New Testament books. I have to say that I have preached before out of the book of Titus, but never before out of the book of Philemon the letter of Philemon, and, and today Jude. Now, this letter bears Jude's name because it was written by Jude. It is not the same as Titus and Philemon, where each of those two letters were written by the Apostle Paul. And those letters, uh, they get their names because those were the intended recipients <clears throat> of each of those letters. But Jude is different. Who was Jude? Jude was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, a full brother to James. Jude, at, in the early church, must have had influence and leadership. And his influence must have been enough so that he felt uh, the authority to be able to write that letter that we call today uh, the letter of Jude. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn please to the letter of Jude? And we're going to be reading the entire letter. It's just 25 verses. And I'd like to begin, as I said last week at the beginning, uh, let's read the introduction to this letter in verses 1 and 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Now, that's called the salutation. And the first thing that you notice when you read this salutation, this letter, is that the recipient uh, is not specifically named. M many times, most times, these kinds of letters are written to an individual, and that individual's name is found in that very first part of the letter. Or it's written to a group of people, maybe a church, uh, the Church of Colossus or the Church of Thessalonica. But here that's not the case. And so it appears that this letter of Jude was something called a circular letter, uh, intended truly to be written or to be read in a number of different settings. Um, Another thing that you'll notice as you read the book of Jude, there is an absence of very personal details in this letter. Uh, it leads us again to assume that this is not written to a specific person, but a number of churches, a number of people. And if indeed it is a circular letter, this letter would have been read in so many different congregations in the early church, in a variety of locations, to a variety of people. And you know what that does? That really just encourages me today. Uh, I think of how Jude wrote that letter to so many different people in so many different circumstances. And those concerns that he expressed would have been applicable to all sorts of different people, including me, and I, I believe including you. He begins, verses 3 and 4. He outlines his topic. In verses 3, he says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled 
and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Jude says, I'd love to talk to you, write to you today about the salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, but I feel I need to talk about something else. And he raises for us a word of warning. He, he said um, his concern about that problem uh, that he could see that was coming into the church compelled him to issue a warning. And the warning here in verses in, in starts in verse 4 continues right through to verse 18 the majority of the letter contains a warning you know we live in a day and an age if people should know about warnings it's us we are absolutely inundated with warnings uh, there's warning labels on absolutely everything and some of them are not that smart for example our wheelbarrow. Um, I've never used it on the highway, but it might be kind of fun. Um, and then there's a stroller. I suppose if you tried to fold your child up in it, you, you could soon find out if your child was flexible or not. And then there's a thermometer. You know, and I've always felt that that's the reason you should wipe it first with alcohol. Uh, your coffee cup. Yeah, don't do that. You know, I can really see that as being a hazard. Uh, the jet ski. Um, hey, Joe, how much fuel is left in your tank? Gee, I don't know. It's too dark to see. You got a match? Oh, my goodness. The, the mouse image. Now, this warning label is on a package of rat poison. Warfarin. So the only reason I could think of this is that you don't want your rodent friend to die from cancer. You'd rather have him bleed internally. Uh, fish hook. The fish hook. Now, do I really need a label to figure this one out? And last, I mean, if anyone eats toner, they absolutely deserve what they get. You know, dumb warnings. Our culture is overwhelmed by warnings. And it could be that is why so many of us seem to ignore them. How many of us actually read all the warning labels that are either attached to or part of the instruction manual of anything? But then again, there are those warnings which we ought to take absolutely seriously. As an example, steep cliff, stay behind the barrier, uh, do not open, electrical shock can kill you, or on a piece of machinery, keep shields in place, risk of dismemberment or loss of life. They're, they're, those warnings you really should take seriously, but you know, there's people that see those kinds of things not as a warning, but rather a challenge. The problem with warnings today are we believe that those warnings really are for everybody else except me. Now, here we have Jude bringing a warning. Uh, this warning is one that we need to listen to and we need to obey. And in verse 4, he begins, he says, For certain individuals have, whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our sovereign and Lord. Now what Jude is doing is he's going to the wall and he's pulling the fire alarm. He's saying these ungodly people had infiltrated the Christian assemblies and they were teaching that the grace of God was a license for immorality. Literally what they were doing is that they were saying, they were spreading the lie, that the only way grace could be experienced was if you sinned. 
And so there, therefore, consequently, sin more to experience more grace. Uh, but Paul dealt with this very same notion in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. He begins that chapter by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are, we are those who have died to sin. How can, it, how can we live in it any longer? And what Paul is talking about and what Jude is speaking about here are those conscious acts of sin. And Jude sounds the alarm. He tells them that there was a time of reckoning that was coming for these people. He points to three Old Testament examples. Starting at verse 5, it says, Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And anyone that reads the book of Exodus will find that. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In verse 7, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. And they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, if you do read the book of Exodus, you'll find yourself reading story after story of how some of those that had experienced the miraculous freedom, they had been delivered from the land of Egypt. They had been miraculously saved by the power uh, of God, and yet they still did not believe and were later destroyed. Uh, Jude points back into the, into the um, edges of time when the angels were cast into darkness, because even though they knew God, they rebelled against his authority. It says that a third of the heavenly host fell. And then there's the mention of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's Jude's third example. And, and if you look again in the book of Genesis, you'll find themselves giving themselves up to sexual immorality, to perversion. And it's said that a rain of sulfur came down upon them. Now, if you continue on to verses 8 and 10, Jude continues to warn these Christians. And here we find something that's kind of puzzling. Read verses 8 and 10. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams... These ungodly people, he's referring to these Christians, pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Verse 9, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Now, as you take a look at this illustration that Jude uses here, it's not in the Bible. It is found in a non-canonical book called The Testament of Moses. And that book was written somewhere around the last century before Christ or first century AD. And Jude makes use of not just this book, the Testament of Moses, but later on in verses 14 and 15, he uses another non-canonical book called the Book of Enoch. When I say non-canonical, people think I'm trying to be smart. I'm, I'm really <laughs> just trying to use a word that makes sense. It means that it wasn't included in the Bible by the early church. Those 66 books of the Bible that we have today came through a rigorous process of examination by the early church. And that process took years, up to 400 years following the day of Pentecost described in the book of Acts. And yet even up to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, some of the books of the Bible that we have today were continued to be contested 
by some of the reformers, by people none other than Martin Luther. He didn't like the book of James. Now, my, my, my apologies for attempting to become technical and scholarly sounding. And if you know me, I'm neither. But we do need to know. Why does Jude use non-canonical books to make his point? Why does he draw from these illustrations that aren't included in Scripture? And the answer, the simple answer is, Jude could use whatever he wanted to make his point. And what I mean by that is, remember, when Jude wrote this little letter, and they're not too sure exactly the year, it could have been somewhere in the early 60 ADs, there was no canon of Scripture. The books of the Bible hadn't yet been determined. Um, he uses reference at hand to illustrate his point. And from the Testament of Moses and from the book of Enoch. And I, honestly, I don't, I don't lose sleep over this. He wrote at a time when the Bible was still in formation. Anyway, let's continue on. Verse 11. Woe to them. They've taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, again, a word of explanation. Cain, of course, was the brother of Abel. Murdered his brother Abel, if you look at the book of Genesis. And the reason he did so was jealousy. The reason he did so was his own sense of, of, uh, of not being uh, God's favorite. And they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Balaam was a false prophet and um, was hired to literally prophesy against the Israelites. <laughs> And he did so because of money. He wanted money. So what Jude is telling them, he said, these people, these Christians are jealous. They, they've, they're, they're into this whole thing because of profit. And last but not all, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Korah was one that set himself up against the leadership of the people of Israel. He took issue with Moses and, and uh, his brother Aaron and um, Miriam. And he led a, a rebellion against the leadership and was killed. But Jude continues, verse 12. He says, These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They're wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. That's incredibly colorful language. But if you take the time and take a look at what Jude is trying to say here, he says these people are of no consequence. There's nothing, there's nothing in them. They, they, they are ungodly. There's no root. There's no resilience. There's no commitment to Jesus Christ. And then we find in verse 14, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone, to convict them of all the ungodly acts they have committed to their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude says these people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves, flatter them others for their own advantage. Incredible language. But the warning of Jude is clear. The people that Jude is warning against are those who are part of the church, consider themselves to be influential or even teachers in these various Christian fellowships. And, and so Jude is warning these churches about these people. How do, you, how do you know these people? How do you discern who they are? Well, I think there's a few ways. First of all, there's a general disregard of personal holiness. They live like a Christian on Sunday and the devil the rest of the week. For them, church is an event held on a Sunday. 
It has very little to do with commitment. Or if it is, it's generally despised. The holiness that God calls us to as we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, there's very little concern. And not only is there no concern for your own personal holiness, these people have little concern expressed for other people. Their concern is for themselves. How does this affect me? How can I, uh, these things that are happening at church, how are they going to benefit me? And, and again, it needs to be said, these people are in church. He's, he's not talking about people that have not come into the uh, perimeter or the, uh, uh, the uh, body of Christ. And finally, last but not least, there's others as well, but they emphasize grace, but not repentance. They emphasize grace, but not repentance, as a justification of their own ongoing sinful conduct. God will forgive me anyway. I don't need to worry about this. What's your problem? What's your issue? Quite a warning that Jude has left with these people. And then he comes to the last part, waiting. I call it waiting. It could be encouragement. He ends his letter with a call to persevere. And he says, first of all, remember what the apostles said. Verse 17. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere nat natural instincts and do not have the spirit. He says, remember, this is what you were warned about. Secondly, he says, but you build yourselves up in the faith. Pray in the spirit of God. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait upon the Lord. Verse 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Third, he says, show mercy. Show mercy. Um, the word mercy is found frequently in this small letter. Show mercy to those who are struggling with their faith. Um, save others, he says, by snatching them from the fire. Show mercy mixed with fear to those who don't know the Lord. Verses 22 and 23. Be merciful to those who doubt. Now, he's not talking about those that have, uh, with tremendous conviction, made, made up their mind. Uh, they're going to be uh, rabble-rousers. They're going to be people that will um, uh, that will bring a, a distorted gospel. He said, be merciful to those who doubt, the people that are caught. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It, Jude says, in the midst of all of what you're experiencing right now, be the believer that God has designed you to believe, designed you to be. Now, finally, we have this amazing doxology at the very end of this passage. It is my favorite doxology of all the doxologies found in Scripture. Jude concludes with this, and it is my hope today that you will read this along with me as I conclude this morning. We're going to have it up on the screen. Before we read, let me remind you of the warning that Jude felt compelled to issue to the early church. And through them, he issues us this warning through the person and conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying very clearly to us today, live for Jesus. Let your lives count for Jesus Christ. Don't justify your bad attitudes or your behavior by saying that God's going to forgive me anyway. You know what that kind of thing is? It's hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't do things just for appearance sake. So if you mess up, 
Repent of it. Confess it before God. Confess it before those you have hurt or wounded. Live it out at home and at work and at school and at church. Let your light shine before men. May they recognize by your behavior, by your good works, that you're children of the King. Now let's read the doxology together. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Father, I trust as we've been reading those words that they may have been impacting our spirit. These words written so long ago, to you be the glory, to you, Lord God, be the majesty and power and authority to you, O oh God, our Savior. Lord, we live in a troubled age. And many of the very things that Jude was warning the early church about, we can see evidence of it today. People whose Christianity is not sincere, but rather a show. People who have not allowed their commitment to Christ go any more than skin deep. They may have a taste that has only inoculated them. It's not, uh, not allowed them to catch the disease. It has not allowed them, God, to come into full relationship with yourself. I pray for anyone this morning who says, you know, I'm wondering whether I might be like those people that caused problems back in the early church. And today I want to I want to confess God forgive me. And may my forgiveness God not be only a lip service before you but may it be a consequence of a heart that is repentant. And say God forgive me. Forgive me. Come change my life. I wait for you. I wait for you. And Lord God, I praise you today for the warning that we have from Jude, the encouragement to wait, to rely on our Lord. Lord, may that be our, our heart's cry today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.